Daniel chapter 3, verse 24. If you can have it, if you have it, signify by saying, I have the bread. You have the bread. Reading from the Amplified Version. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way, Father. Mm. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Verse 24. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, looked and was astounded, and he jumped up and said to his counselors, did we not throw three men who were tied up in the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He answered, look, somebody say look. Look, I see four men untied, hmm. walking around, Lord have mercy, walking around. Hmm. Some of y'all shouldn't be walking walking help me today around in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt <laughs> and here's my favorite part and the appearance of the fourth looks like the son of God Ooh, help me today do me a favor and help me preach. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, yeah. when Jesus shows up. I'll let you fill in the blank after that. When Jesus shows up. When, when Jesus shows up. I, I don't care what it looks like, but when Jesus, oh, you might want to throw in the towel, but when Jesus shows up, You're going through something just be encouraged that Jesus is on the way I said he's on the way he's on the way he's on the way he's gonna show up for you come on I got to preach y'all sit down hallelujah hallelujah when Jesus mm. <laughs> I can shout about that already when Jesus shows up Lord have mercy I don't want to get ahead of myself Mm. But something happens when he shows up. We'll talk about it a little later. Now listen, last week we discussed the importance of staying obedient to the assignment that God has called us to do. Uh, we examined the story of Nehemiah, um, how he was tasked uh, leaving his normal routine, um, his normal way of life as a cupbearer for the king um, in order to go to the ransacked city of Jerusalem uh, to lead the charge, the task to rebuild the city walls. Um, we find uh, in that story that he did not quit working in spite of naysayers and in spite of the opposition. Um, he completed the task at hand. Just a recap from last week. Um, but for this week's dialogue, we'll build off of Nehemiah's story by jumping ahead a few books um, in the story of Daniel in chapter 3. Um, our text this morning drops us in the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, we have a known evil king here uh, by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of this, uh, uh, this principality, this kingdom, this country, but yet he has an ego problem. We, uh, he was the king, uh, but yet he had no respect for others. Um, he was the king, but he had no regard for the people that he led. He was the king, but he had no integrity. He, he was the king, but he oftentimes said one thing and, did, did, and then did another. It sounds like some of the politicians we have in office today. Specifically the one, no, never mind. Uh, anyway, we have King Nebuchadnezzar who has a dream. Uh, and one day he decides that he wants to erect a golden statue that everyone in the kingdom must worship. Pastor Sarah, in order to understand this, we must first put this into context. Uh, 
the Babylonians were known for worshiping idol gods. So uh, they were known for building and bowing before objects that they chose to be their god. Uh, so it was nothing, thanks of God, out of the ordinary for the king to erect a statue for the people to worship. Um, and in our 21st century intellectual mindsets, I'm sure we must be thinking that it, it's pretty stupid for someone to decide to worship uh, something that has no life and has no power to change, something that's inanimate and something that has no real value. When in reality, most of us do this every day of our lives. Y'all not going to like how I'm talking today. An idol God is anything that occupies the spot that God should have in your heart and in your mind. I'll say it again. An idol God is anything that occupies the spot that God should have in your heart and in your mind. Some of y'all wake up every morning and the first thing you do is pick up your phone and hit the Facebook app. That might just be idol worship. Some of y'all, you know, you were going strong and you came to Bible study and you were praying and you had a strong relationship with God until you got a man. Oh, help me. And now all of a sudden, we can't even get you to come to church on Sunday morning. You might just be involved in idol worship. Look at somebody and say, what do you worship? What, what do you worship? And you might not have a relationship that took the place of God, but uh, some of you all go straight to the kitchen and stuff your face every time your day is not going the way you want it to go. That emotional eating, that's, that might just be idol idol worship. No, I, I'm not scared of y'all. I know I'm talking good. Anyway, so the king Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this golden image to advance the progression of idol worship here in the Babylonian kingdom. Yeah, I'm going to take my time and preach it. The text says that he calls his leaders, he calls them over uh, to see what he had built. He, he called the members of the court. He called his magistrates. Can I tell the story? Is that all right? Yeah, he calls the senators, he calls the mayors, he calls Lottie Dottie and come on here. He, he called them to come. He said, come to Babylon and everybody that came, the text says that at the moment you hear the sound of the music, somebody y'all, somebody knows the story, you are to fall down and worship the image that the king has set up. So the king makes a decree that if you do not worship when the music plays, you will be thrown into the fire. Now is where the story starts to get a little juicy. You know, we have three Jewish individuals, three Hebrew boys, as the text says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Somebody say a billy goat. Somebody say a bad Negro. I don't know. I hope I don't get in trouble. Mm, help me. Anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are part of Babylonian leadership. Uh, but they are Jewish. That's significant. Uh, so idol worship was not something they believed in doing. They, they believed in one God and one God alone. So when the music starts, if I can tell the story, the music starts to play and the three Hebrew boys, they refused to bow. When they refused to bow, the, ch the text says that there were certain Chaldeans that were watching and they decided to tell the king about their disobedience. Now, I need you to understand that this decree was that when the music starts, everybody was supposed to bow and worship. But the text says that there were certain Chaldeans that accused the three Hebrew boys of not worshiping. I'm going to say it again just for the people in the back. It says the decree was that when the music starts to play, everybody was supposed to stop what they were doing. They were supposed to bow and they were to worship. It goes on to say that certain Chaldeans then accused the three Hebrew boys of not worshiping. I'm going to say it on this side one more time. The text says that when the music starts to play, Everybody was supposed to stop what they were doing and they were supposed to bow and worship. But then it goes on to say that these certain men, these certain Chaldeans were watching and they accused the three Hebrew boys of not worshiping. Now, 
One of my favorite preachers, Bishop Rudolph McKissick out of Jacksonville, Florida, he put it like this. He said, if everybody was supposed to bow, how in the world were they able to see what the three Hebrew boys were doing? And he says, in this life, there are two types of people. You have worshipers and you have watchers. And when you come into God's house, there are two types of people. You have worshipers <laughs> and you have watchers. Look at somebody saying, now, which one are you? Which, which one are you? Now, I began to think about it and I'm almost done. I'm on my way home. I, I began to wonder why they were watching him in the first place. Now, there's a, there's a significant revelation here. I need you to follow me because we're going to go back a little bit in time. Uh, 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 now, the only reason the Hebrew boys were in this position in the first place, if you read your Bible, is because in chapter 2, a chapter before this one, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about the statue that he erected, okay? So he called, here they are again, the Chaldeans, help me, to come and to interpret the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He said, come, I need you to help me because I don't understand what I saw in my dream. So he called the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans came and they weren't able to interpret the dream but Daniel somebody say Daniel Daniel the prophet Daniel who was a Hebrew he he came and he said listen I, I you know I prayed about it I, I'll tell you what the dream means and so he was successful in interpreting the dream for the king and because of his success, he was elevated and promoted in the kingdom. And Daniel was able to have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego help him rule Babylon alongside him. Mm -hmm. So the significance of this is that Jewish people were the lowest on the totem pole in the Babylonian kingdom. And they normally had no business ruling over anyone. But yet we have three Hebrew boys who, who, who were the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were able to be promoted amongst the people. So now we have a conspiracy that's about to be uncovered. Uh, we can speculate that the certain Chaldeans uh, that accused the Hebrew boys in chapter 3 Hmm. Well, the part of the same group that got embarrassed for not being able to interpret the dream in chapter two. What am I trying to say? Somebody said, what are you trying to say? For those of you that are trying to figure out why folks don't like you and why they can't stand you, I can tell you why. It's because of the anointing. Why they're talking about you and you aren't even thinking about them, it's because of the anointing. Why in the world are they trying to sabotage your vision and your dream? It's because of the it's because of the anointing. Look at somebody say, I can't help what, that I've been anointed by God. I, I can't help that God chose me. I, I can't help that I'm favored by God. And guess what? I won't apologize for it. Won't apologize for it. So the text says, the people went and they reported to the king. I'm almost done. Give me five more stoked seconds, not marital minutes. <laughs> Tell him that when he get back. So the text said that people went and they reported to the king that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not bow. Hmm. And the king called them up to question them. And what I love about this text is that it reinforces the standard that we must have as believers. When the Hebrews decided not to bow in worship to the idol God, they took a stand for what they knew was right. And in this season, I believe that God is looking for some individuals that don't mind standing up for what you know is right. I know we live, we live in a world where anything goes. You can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. You can say anything you want to say and have nobody hold you accountable. And I believe that some of us are so concerned about individual truth that we negate the reality that there is an absolute truth. Is that God is looking for some people that don't mind standing up for righteousness, standing up for holiness, standing up for what you know is right. You got to stand for something or you will fall for, fall for anything. 
What's admirable about the three Hebrew boys is that they weren't swayed about their belief even when everybody else around them was doing it. Mm. And if you all can be honest, I know some of us, we would have bowed in worship simply because we wanted to fit in. <laughs> we would have wanted to go along with the crowd. But then there are those of us who have the mindset to say we will serve God and stand for what's right till the day we die. Is that anybody's declaration that you will stand for what's right? Talking about I'm not trying to fit in. I'm not trying to go along with the crowd. As a matter of fact, I don't even care about what you think of me. I made up in my mind that I will serve God even if I have to do it by my by myself. So verse 16 says the king called the Hebrew boys. I'm not boring y'all, am I? Okay. King called the three Hebrew boys over and they said, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to answer you on this point. Because <laughs> see, he asked them if they had bowed. He wanted to see if it was true or not. And possibly he thought that they would be intimidated and lie. <laughs> Help me today. Because they were looking at a person with a position of power and he possibly, he thought that he held their life in his hands. And so when he asked them that, he was probably looking for an excuse. But here the truth comes out. He said, we don't need to answer you about this. <laughs> you think you're the king, but you don't know who we are. Who we serve, I, I, I don't really feel the need in giving you any excuses. I don't feel the need to give you any type of lies to cover up what I've been doing because I know what I've been doing is right. See, there's a certain level of assurance you have when you know you've been living the way you're supposed to be living. When you know you've been doing the thing that you know is right, there's a certain confidence that you can have. So he says, we don't, we don't need to answer you on this point. He says... If it be so, our God whom we serve is able. <laughs> He's able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will rescue us from your hand. Now, I could really preach a whole sermon just off of that verse alone. What, what we could all learn from this is that their faith was represented in their response. I said their faith was represented in their response. The three Hebrew boys were faced with something deadly, and yet their response was full of faith. And here's a prophetic word that I would like to release to just about a hundred of you all that are faced with something deadly. I want to speak over your life now that in the name of Jesus, you would have unwavering level of confidence that not only will, that will come upon you, but will overtake you. I say you are going to have a certain level of confidence in the next season that will not only come upon you, but it shall overtake you. And even in the midst of a deadly situation, you shall stand firm in God's ability. And from this moment forward, say from this moment forward, somebody shout it. From this moment forward, your response shall be he's able. Oh, we could go home off of that. I don't care what it looks like. The doctor report not looking the way you want it to look. Your response should be he's he's able. Children acting a fool in school, your response should be he's he's able. Your spouse, your husband, your wife isn't acting the way you want them to act. Your response should be he's he's able. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how deadly the situation you're facing may be. Your confidence in the ability of God should be unwavering, unwavering, unwavering. So the text tells us that the king was furious and he commanded his strongest men to throw them in the fiery furnace. Hmm. He commanded his strongest men to throw them in the fiery furnace. He commanded his strongest men to throw them in the fiery furnace. Some of you all feel like that God has, is probably just about giving you, I mean, the, the, excuse me, the devil has just about given you the worst shots he could give you. And I come to tell you that even the worst plot, even the worst attack from the enemy has no power to match God's power. Yeah. So, text says he commanded his strongest men to throw them in the fiery furnace. 
But verse 22 says, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was extremely hot, the flame of the fire killed the men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now let's really sit down before we overreact. Let's, let's think about it because if we're going to shout, let's just shout like we know what we're talking about here. Okay, so the strongest men were used to put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. But then it says in verse 22 that those same strong men were killed while they were putting them in the fire. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better be careful how you handle me. You better be careful how you talk about me. You better be careful how you plot to attack me. You better be careful what you do concerning me because the same plot and plan you used to attack me is called the power of boomerang. It's going to come right back on you. You better be careful because God don't play about me. He don't. Y'all sit down. I'm getting nervous, please. <laughs> be careful how you handle me. The same men, Lord have mercy, the same men who threw them in the furnace were the ones that were killed. Be careful how you handle me. Be careful. Be careful because God will, he'll fight for me. He, you better tread carefully because touch not my anointed and, and, and do my prophet no harm. I, I declare to you that the very plot your enemies had for you will boomerang and come right back. Somebody just shout boomerang, boomerang, boomerang. It's coming back to you. It's coming back. You better be careful. It's coming back. Mm. Help me today. So, the guys, three Hebrew boys, were thrown into fiery furnace. Mm. And the scripture says that they were bound hand and feet. They threw them in bound. <laughs> then all of a sudden, somebody say all of a sudden, the text says in verse 24 that the king was astonished. Peeps in there. I know I put three folks in there. They said it was three Hebrew boys, but there's another individual. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, before we overreact, let's, let's hold it. Before we can really get to that, let's, let's, let's really think about it again because I, I want to make sure we understand. So, he threw him in. Now, I'm trying to work it out myself. Y'all looking at me. I, <laughs> they threw him in. And we really want to shout about the fact that there was another in there. Yeah, we'll shout about that in a little bit. It's just, wait a minute. But I really want to really highlight in the text where it says that not only was there a fourth in there, but in the beginning it said they threw a man bound, hand and foot. Bound, hand and foot. But skipping over the fact that there's an extra individual that came out of nowhere, really. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how in the world they got untied. So this same fire was potent enough, was strong enough, was fiery enough to untie them. But it wasn't strong enough to kill them. Oh my God. Do y'all just understand what I just said? The thing that you think is the worst thing in your life is the very thing God is going to use to free you up. 
to just take five seconds and give a praise right through there, right through, right through there. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Now, the very thing that the enemy used to destroy you, I'm getting happy by myself, I'm sorry, <laughs> is the very thing that is used to tie, to untie you. So, that really means that greater is he <laughs> that is in you. Greater is he that's with you, oh Lord, than he that is in the world. So let me tell you something. Sometimes the storm that you're in, the test that you're in, the tribulation that you're facing is the very thing God uses to push you into your destiny to push you into the place that God would have you to be, to push you into the place where the world can see that can't nobody do you like. All right, well. So, now, we're getting ready to go home. We can talk about what we said before. Now, we have three Hebrew boys that were entered thrown into the furnace. Hmm. Now we can go back to that. And the king stands up and again, what's going on? <laughs> I mean, could you really imagine what, he, what his face looked like? I, I put three people in there. Now, unless there was somebody already there when they threw him in, there's no way. I didn't see anybody come or leave, so it, it, what, what's going on here? It's four individuals that we shouted about earlier that are walking around. Oh, how he walks with me. And oh, how he talks with me. And oh, how he tells me that I am his Somebody over there got it. I'm his own. So they're walking around, and the king is saying, "There, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. I put hmm, three in there, but I see four walking around, Lee. And it says the fourth one looks like the son of God." Well, I'm going to tell you why you just missed your shouting cue. Because the book of Daniel is in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus is really not supposed to show up. You know, talk about the 40 and two generations, all those different people, and he's supposed to be born of a virgin named Mary and Joseph. Come on, help me today. But here in Daniel chapter three, it said the fourth looks like the son of God. Now help me, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, when Jesus shows up, I'll let you go ahead and finish it. I don't care what it looks like. People have counted you out. They said it was no help for you. They said it was no hope for you. But Jesus is showing up on the scene. Even when you think it's too dirty. Even when you think it's too messy. Even when you think it's too bad. Jesus is showing up on the scene. He'll make a visit especially for you. He has no respect or respect. Look at your neighbor and say, he's on the way. He's on the way. He, he's on the way. He's on the way. He's on the way. Jesus is on the way. I don't care what it looks like. Jesus is on the way. There is no secret what God can do if he's done it for others. If he did it for them. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. do it for you. 
try to decide where to go from here. He'll do it. He'll do it for you. God has no respecter of persons. If he did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he wasn't supposed to show up on the scene. But Jesus will make a spec. God makes house calls. Do you know that? He'll make a special visit, especially for you. Look at somebody say, I'm his child, and, and he cares about me. I, I'm his child, and, and he cares about me. I, I'm his child, and, and he cares about me. I, I don't know about you, but seen God do it before and, and I'm crazy enough to believe that he can do it again now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask a thing according to the power that works in you when Jesus shows up everything has to change when Jesus shows up my problem has to get better when Jesus shows up things are shifting on my behalf when Jesus shows up I pray that I to believe hey. when Jesus shows when Jesus shows up you ought to you ought to give him praise because when you look back over your life begin to think things over you can begin to see where he stepped you were never alone eh? when you look all along I can say I was never by myself but there was there was a God that stepped in the furnace with help me today the God that steps in the furnace with you. He won't leave you by yourself. Help me today. Tell you a story and I'm going to get out your way. There was a mother and a father who had just had a baby. Mother stays at home all day with the child. And as you know, babies tend to get spoiled when you hold them all day long. And every time it was time to put the child down for a nap, the baby would begin to cry. So over time, the mother got the baby somewhat of a schedule. And she spent her days there with the child. One day, the father took off of work, and he just so happened to be at the home with the both of them. The mother does her normal routine, and she puts the baby in the crib for a nap. Baby begins to cry. The mother comes, and looks at her husband and says, don't touch the baby because he needs to go to sleep and he needs to learn how to go to sleep on his own. Well, baby begins to cry and the father sneaks in there, picks the baby up, starts to rock the baby. Baby in his arms. The mother he is that the baby was not crying anymore. She comes in the room and she says, didn't I tell you not to pick the baby up? Because after you're going back to work, <laughs> I'm still here with the baby. Please put the baby down. So the father says, oh, okay, I'll put the baby down. So he puts the baby back in the crib. The baby begins to cry again. The mother is smiling to herself because she says it's probably killing him that this baby <laughs> is crying. All of a sudden, catch this, the baby stops crying. and She says, I know he hasn't picked this baby up again. She walks in the room and she looks at her dismay. The father was in the crib with the baby. What am I trying to say? He looks at his wife and says, you told me I couldn't pick the baby up. You didn't tell me that I couldn't get in the crib with him. And God might not save you from your situation, but he sure enough won't leave you alone. You, you ought to give him some praise. Y'all still ain't got it. You ought to give him some praise because he might not have saved you from 
brother, but he walked through you, through it with you. Yeah. Yeah, glory to God. All over the house, if we could rest on our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us for today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others all over the world by investing today. You can give at grovechurchva.com slash giving. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more messages like this one.